Here's our interview with essayist, media critic, and author Patrick Lawrence, where we take a deeper dive into some of his most recent Shear Post articles. Hope you enjoy. Uh, from from your from one of your articles, uh, it says uh, you you said that this suggests these correspondents are on officially conducted tours, in essence embedded and seeing only what Ukrainian officials want them to see. Um, this is the sort of thing that happens when uh, North Koreans let correspondents in on restricted visas. Um, so I was wondering, do we know this for sure, or is this suspected based on other what happens in other wars? And um, has mainstream journalists uh, journalism always been about picking your side and doing reporting that supports your side in war, or was there ever a time where war journalism was more about, you know, an objective search to, uh, for truth? Uh, yeah, there's a lot in that question. Let me try to get it all. If I miss something, remind me, because uh, I want to reply to each dimension of the question, okay? Uh, do we know those car the occasion to fill in your listeners was um, a, a report from Carlotta Gall uh, of the New York Times uh, from a village in eastern Ukraine that had been uh, shelled by uh, the Russian military. Uh, and uh, Carlotta was um, Carlotta was describing uh, the consequences of a of a missile attack on an apartment complex, uh, and if you put together, <sighs> the Times has a way of meeting its obligations to tell you the basic facts, but in such a in such an obfuscating fashion, you have to sort of sit down and study it, right? Uh, the facts, as one could discern them, were that it was an apartment complex, but it had been emptied out, but for a few stubborn residences, and it was effectively an improvised army base for the Ukrainian forces. That's the story. Uh, Carlotta uh, reported that, and uh, uh, I went around the um, internet, it transpires that uh, Reuters reported it, I think AP reported it, and uh, the Wash Post reported it. Now, there are a lot of villages in Ukraine, and why were all those four correspondents in the same little village at the same time? I think we need to call this a surmise, Maxwell, but I think a pretty good one, that they were on an officially guided tour of that village because the Ukrainian side wanted them to see that apartment complex and put forward that apartment complex uh, as, uh, as, you know, another Russian attack on a civilian target. That, that's what was going on. My surmise is perfectly confident, right? I, I do have to call it one, but now, <clears throat> The question is embeddedness, all right? Uh, uh, I mentioned North Korea. Well, you know, when I was a correspondent in Asia, uh, a, a lot of people, a lot of correspondents, you know, ooh, a trip to North Korea, how exotic. It was my worst nightmare because you were only gonna see what you were supposed to see and you were going to come back and write cookie cutter coverage about North Korea and, uh, you know, it would be a sort of a big non-event. Um, the question of embeddedness by way of Western correspondence, it came up in the post-Vietnam period. Um, the Vietnam correspondents, uh, let's not overstate the case, most of them carried water obediently enough for the Pentagon. Um, in their reports, but some of them did not. Quite famously, uh, a trio of guys, David Halberstam, New York Times, Neil Sheehan, UPI, and later New York Times, uh, <coughs> Malcolm Brown Associated Press, right? They wrote very, very significant um, uh, files from Vietnam and had, as did others of, of, of lesser stature, uh, 
and had something to do with turning sentiment against the war. Of course, the anti-war movement was a very significant factor in, in the later Vietnam years from uh, building momentum uh, at, at, as soon as Johnson escalated in 65, right? Uh, uh, and so they learned a big lesson uh, in Vietnam. And the next war of consequence uh, where correspondents were on the ground was the first Gulf War in 1991. That's when correspondents were embedded. They were not allowed to go anywhere that the military, they were embedded, meaning you are with, uh, you are with uh, brigade or platoon X and you will go with them and you will see what they want you to see, what, what pops out the other end of the sausage machine there is, you will write what you see and we are going to control what you see and therefore we control the coverage, right? Uh, I, I've been dead set against embeddedness. Uh, I've never been embedded. I, I've been, or had any occasion to be. Uh, uh, I've been, vigorously opposed to embeddedness uh, since uh, since it made its first appearance uh, in, in, in the uh, first Gulf War. Um, and that's what we're getting in Ukraine. It's objectionable, right? Uh, now, uh, um, your larger question, has it always been this way? Well, war coverage, um, War complicates the relationship between the press uh, and power, um, and not just military power, political power, right? Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, take the big wars, World War II. Yeah, the Western correspondents uh, reported uh, on the war from the Allied side. Uh, I, I think some of this is inevitable. Um, uh, but the, the larger question is, does it have to be this way? I certainly don't think it has to be this way in Ukraine. Uh, we do have correspondents uh, uh, with Western backgrounds who are looking at the war from the other side. There are a few names to mention. Uh, they're very hard to find because of the nature of their work, uh, but they are there. I learned from them. Um, and uh, I think the question is more acute in circumstances such as Ukraine than it would be in uh, a, a larger conflict such as World War II, okay? Um, um, it's a complicated problem and I'm not laying down a, uh, you know, a, a sort of be all end all answer to this question, right? Um, uh, but it, it, the question lands nicely with me because after 29 years as a correspondent in Asia, one of the questions I put, I went on to teach at the University of Hong Kong. And, and one of the questions I posed in my first course, which I named um, Reinventing the Foreign Correspondent, it's a wonderful course, was do correspondents, war or peace, do correspondents always have to reflect the politics and ideology of the country of their medium? I'm a New York Times correspondent. Do I always have to report such that I reflect the American point of view? Uh, history will give us uh, an unwelcome answer. Sorry, yes, that's how it works. But my argument is in the 21st century, when one of the most fundamental imperatives facing Americans and other people is that we learn to see from the perspectives of other people, uh, we have to transcend this uh, self and other binary.
right uh, that's my that's my reply if you have if you want me to elaborate i'm happy to do that um i think that was that was great um and just kind of going into the media side of things um you mentioned how Le Express is a centrist uh, French um, journal and how they run people like John Mirsch, uh, Mirsch 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 and how and you suggest how that's more common in a place like Europe compared to America. Um, why do you think that is? Maybe it's a it's a huge question to to dive into, but just like in terms of what we're getting with Ukraine, in terms of somebody advocating for diplomacy getting more kind of attention there compared to here, um, the kind of reasons behind that or the structure of our press. Yeah. Um, uh, look, a couple of reasons for that in, in my view. Uh, one is uh, the this, this situation in Europe. Um, they are, uh, uh, let me put it this way. If, if you're sitting in Belgium and you get in the car, in three hours, you can be in Germany or France and maybe a little more in Italy, okay? There are other people around you. Um, uh, we don't have that. You can drive for five days and come across nothing but other Americans, no one but other Americans. Um, it changes the consciousness, right? Um, second, the European circumstances are more complex than ours. We, we uh, I'm not gonna say we're happy to do this, I don't think, nearly as many Americans uh, are, are happy with what's going on in Ukraine as, as, as purported. Um, uh, but we are rather distant. We are untouched by it, more or less, at least so far. Gas prices, yes, all that. But in, in Europe, it's a very serious crisis. Not a crisis on the way. I think it already is one. And so the, the French, the Germans, the Italians, there's more variety of opinion. There, there are more perspectives that are permitted, right? Uh, this is not only, uh, 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 not only uh, uh, in the matter of the Ukraine question, it's just their political tradition, right? Um, uh, uh, which leads me to the, third part of my answer. We are an ideologically driven nation. Um, we are not, we, what the Biden administration is, is doing now with its uh, newest binary, uh, Democrats versus authoritarians, and this is, I just wrote about this in another context, and, and, and this is supposed to define all of humanity. Um, uh, Europeans don't, they are not so ideologically driven, right? Yes, they are Western in their, in their perspectives, but not as a matter of ideology. Um, it's a matter of, I mean, what should rule statecraft are interests, common interests, right um and, and uh not values which is another word for ideology right um uh, plus or minus uh and so they don't share that and so they're interested in uh a man like mearsheimer uh you know mearsheimer is a very august scholar uh with a with an extraordinary uh, uh record of of excellent work Right. You may or may not agree with him, but his stature as a scholar is beyond dispute. Um, and my point in that essay was, wh where are we when, when people like John Mearsheimer are, are, are interviewed at considerable length in, in L'Express, but not in, the, not in the Western press, except for pieces that whose, the subtext of which is they're going to take them down, right? Different, different political culture. Uh, you know. um, and in one of your recent articles on uh, Sheer Post, you described the New York Times as the government surveilled Times. And um, at first, supervised. When, wait, wait. Oh, government wait. Su supervised. Be careful. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. My apologies. 
uh, the government supervised times. And um, at first when I read that, I thought that it was like hyperbole or, or a satirical statement making fun of the times. But then uh, Narda, our editor, told us about how you explained to her that this is actually a real story. And I was wondering if you could go more in depth on uh, that story that you told Narda here. Yeah, happy to. Um, uh, government supervised, you know. Uh, uh, it's true, I love poking at the times, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but uh, it's all among friends. Um, uh, look, uh, the Times has had uh, questionable relations with the government um, since uh, World War I, I would say. Why do I pick World War I? Well, uh, Walter Lippmann, and a colleague, uh, uh, embarrassing moment, oh, Charles Mers, uh, did a study in the New Republic and published it in 1920 called A Test of the News. You can find it on the internet. And they analyzed New York Times coverage uh, of World War I uh, up to and after the Bolshevik Revolution and uh, the, the Bolsheviks' decision to withdraw from the war, withdraw Russia from the war. This was very important. What the Russians did after October 1917 was very important because the Western powers needed Russia to keep the Germans occupied on the Eastern Front, right? Uh, and so they wanted Russia, cum Soviet Union, to stay in the war, all right? Uh, in, in the months leading up to uh, the October Revolution and, and the months subsequent to it, the Times coverage was very favorable, I'm, I'm speaking in general terms, uh, was very favorable to the Bolsheviks, believe it or not, um, because they were, they wanted them to stay in the war. They wanted to be, they wanted the Russians to be our ally, not unlike what we had in the Second World War. Um, uh, when the Bolsheviks determined we're, we're not on for this capitalist war and pulled out, the Times coverage swiveled like a weather vane um, uh, uh, and the Red Scare commenced. Um, uh, I, I would say the Times' relationship with the Wilson administration, the Wilson administration greatly wanted the Russians to stay in the war. Um, I would say the Times' relationship uh, with the Wilson administration, um, I'm not sure I could say it was supervised, but it was it was unduly close. Uh, read the Lipman Murs study, okay? Um, let's go forward uh, to the 50s. Uh, my date for the start of the Cold War is March 1947 when uh, Truman had addressed Congress about the Greek crisis. Um, subsequent to that, as the Cold War uh, unfolded, the Times had an extremely close relationship with political power in Washington. By the mid 50s, this was more or less institutionalized uh, in that the publisher of the Times at, at that time, Arthur Hayes Salzberger, one of the owning, uh, member of the owning family, uh, had a secrecy agreement with the CIA. And uh, uh, Sulzberger uh, tacitly accepted, um, allowed his correspondence, he did not rule on whether his correspondence could work for the CIA <coughs> as they were employed at the Times. He left it to the correspondence to decide each one. Um, it, the Times withdrew uh, its uh, Mexico bureau chief, a, a very noted man named Sidney Grusin, um, 
because Grusin was reporting Guatemala um, in a way that was favorable to the Arbenz government and its land reform policies. This is just prior to the CIA coup uh, in 1954, um, which was conducted in some measure to protect the interests of United Fruit. Um, and it goes on from there, okay? Uh, the, um, the, the, the government's penetration of the press during the Cold War uh, is very, very extensively documented. Um, and the Times was, was part of that. Now, in our time, we have correspondents such as David Sanger, I remember uh, in 2000, uh, when, uh, when um, the big, uh, was it Cablegate? The, the big WikiLeaks reverse in the autumn of 2010. Uh, I think it was Cablegate. A huge consequential release of documents, uh, timed, uh, you know, consecutive releases came out, uh, I remember I was, I was with friends at a bar in New York, uh, journalist friends, uh, and David Sanger <clears throat> had it on the front page of the Times in, in his piece that the Times had checked with the administration as to which of the WikiLeaks, uh, which of the memos, emails and so on that WikiLeaks released it was okay to publish. I don't know whether I have to go on from there, Maxwell, but there you have it. And um, uh, Sanger has uh, done that uh, severally since then. Okay, I mean, I'm not talking about every day, but there you have it. Uh, um, a very interesting occasion occurred immediately after the 2001, I'm a bit all over the place chronologically here, uh, uh, immediately after the 2001 attacks in Washington and New York, um, Ari Fleischer, the Bush administration's um, press secretary, convened a, tele a telephone conference of all the major Washington editors. Um, among them was Jill Abramson, uh, um, at that time, uh, New York Times bureau chief in Washington. Uh, and she described that telephone conference in extraordinary detail in a, in a speech she gave um, many years later in 2013 or 14. 14. Uh, and she said, we were asked by Ari Fleischer not to write, not to publish stories that would be revealing of um, America's, um, the procedures America uh, put in place in, in order to wage the brand new war on terror. And Fleischer was ex especially concerned that the press did not report on um, the methods employed by the CIA. Uh, I'm talking about torture, kidnapping. I don't go in for euphemisms like uh, extraordinary rendition. You can have that. Kidnapping, um, torture, all that. He did not want those reported. And Jill Abramson told her audience, um, we all agreed to that. Wow. And uh, her, there's an interesting aside here, and I'll finish up. Her explanation for that was, um, we, we journalists, we are patriots too. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier the extensive penetration of the CIA into the press during the Cold War, 50s and 60s. 
The excuse offered by many, many prominent journalists at the time was, I am a patriot. I want to serve my country. Um, I, I am never less than astonished when I think about this for the for for how uh, how extraordinarily flaccid this reasoning is. If an editor or a reporter wants to be a good American, all he or she has to do is be a good editor or a reporter. Um, and uh, the idea that uh, there are certain times when we journalists must abandon our professional standards and our principles in order to serve America. It, it, you know, uh, to my mind, uh, uh, it's really nothing short of disgraceful, but that's what Jill Abramson said. The same excuse that the Alsop brothers offered in the 1950s. Um, I, I, uh, I will leave it there by way of um, government supervised, right? And it seems like, uh in recent times uh that this has happened again with russia gate right this idea of um being a good citizen or a good american overriding your um you know what you're willing to report uh in the way that the lot of the mainstream press covered the leaks of um hillary clinton's emails and anything that came out bad about the clinton campaign um during trump right during the uh uh clinton and trump uh election yeah. right yeah 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 i mean i i I got caught in the undertow on that one too. Um, if you did not, uh, we're we're speaking more broadly than the New York Times now. Uh, if if you did not conform to the orthodox, the Russiagate orthodoxy, you may very easily find yourself in serious trouble, uh, as I did, um, as it has transpired. I mean, one one of the uh, of the many offenses the corporate owned press uh, uh, committed during Russiagate was to put forward the assertions of unnamed intelligence officials as evidence. The Russians did this and we have evidence. Where's the evidence? The spooks are saying so. That's not evidence. That's that's really a, a very major lapse in, in, uh, in, of standards, uh, uh, but they sold it. They sold it. I just had an exchange with somebody and I have a share post column up now. I just had an exchange with somebody in the comment thread um, saying this, that, and the other Putin, you know, da, 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 da. Uh, uh, and we all know this, right? Uh, this is the this is the consequence of uh, of uh, of these sort of delinquencies. Uh, we now have a very great many Americans who accept as evidence the assertions of people who are never named and whose institutions, for, foremost among them the CIA, have long long records of falsification. Right, uh, we're in. I I find this very disturbing, right? Uh, uh, it's gotten us into very serious trouble, I think, uh, by way of the, by way of the, um, what's my word? Uh, the corruption of our public discourse. Yeah, and segueing off that, um, kind of taking it back to the, to the Ukraine, I find that there's a similar kind of, uh, similar activity going on when you consider for example, the you, you get a lot of reports of indiscriminate killings of civilians, and that's always the headline. That's always um, it seems like it's the case in different places. We, you know, you mentioned Chasov Yar. I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly. Well uh, done. Yeah, places, well done. Right. <laughs> places like Mariupol uh, and the Western media will will project that, and then if you try to even question it. Um, you know, you, you're looked at as some sort of Russian apologist, you know, Putin, all, the, all these kind of, you know, smears that don't really have any substance. But how do we go about, you know, tackling these kind of lapses in coverage or even just trying to question it in, you know, uh, yeah, our look, discourse? Look there, Diego. Uh, uh, I'm talking to two journalists, I assume. It's very simple. Don't worry about how they look at you. 
don't worry about what they say. You are answerable. We are answerable to ourselves and to the standards and ethics that we consider fundamental to the profession. The rest is, they're ankle biters. They can do some damage, but uh, certainly, but you've got to hold to it. Um, and and that's, that's the beginning and the end of it. Uh, I, I don't think that, I think the very best thing we can do in direct response to your question is, is that. Hold to it, stay with, examine the circumstances by way of the standards we've learned either in school or by way of our early days in the profession. And that's that. I, I don't, uh, you know, what happened in these various cases, Buka and uh, the village uh, and Mariupol, I don't have a side, I'm not rooting, right? Uh, I'm on the side of, I'm on the side of the truth of things, right? Um, uh, and uh, so we don't know, I've remarked about this in, in Sheer Post and elsewhere. It's an extraordinary war for the uh, near, not complete, but near total absence of reliable reporting. Um, it's one thing, returning to my, our earlier point, it's one thing to report a war from the allied side because you're a member of, the, of an allied nation, right? It's quite another, I should have said this earlier, it's quite another to report uh, at, with gross distortions, omissions, uh, uh, irresponsible omissions, distortions, obfuscations, and let's say lies, okay? Uh, there are no Nazis in Ukraine. I'm sorry, it's just a lie, right? Uh, um, uh, that's another matter. That's not, that's more than a matter of uh, your reporting reflecting one or another side of a conflict, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I think the answer to your question is to, to hold to your standards. And if, if, if what you can judge by way of available evidence leads you to a conclusion that contradicts official accounts, and may or may not match the accounts of the of the Russian side. Don't let it enter into things. That's my answer. And is so is is the reality um, in uh, in in reporting on wars is that the truth is there to find, but that the propaganda and uh, biased reporting and what sometimes it's hard to discern as anything else other than a lie, like in the fact when the mainstream press says that there's no Nazis in Ukraine. Um, is, is it that that makes all the truth convoluted and then it becomes somewhat subjective? Um, or, or, and does that make it so that we never really get an accurate account of what happens in, uh, in war zones? Well, once more, Maxwell, you're, you're, uh, you're asking me about objectivity and subjectivity. Give it to me again, so I understand. Yeah, is is the reality in in war in war reporting that um, the truth is there to find? Because uh, it seems that it's almost it almost seems as though uh, when you're looking at what the New York Times reports and what a journalist like you or Chris Hedges would report, um, that the truth is subjective because it's these people that come from a lot of times similar educational backgrounds, reaching totally opposite perspectives. Um, so is is it that the truth is there, but it's just hard to find? And is it is it by is it bias that is getting in the way of, of yeah, that? Yeah, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, you got a couple of complicated words uh, on the table here, Maxwell. And in the case of subjectivity, I would say a dangerous word, right? Um, uh, it, is the truth available? Look, objectivity is an ideal. And I've argued for a long time, by definition, ideals are never achieved. They wouldn't be ideals if they were achieved, right? Uh, they would be realities. Uh, um, but that's not to say we don't 
hold up the ideal and make it our, so to speak, North Star, the, 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 the measure by which we perform our duties is to strive best we can toward pure objectivity. It's simply impossible. Uh, as soon as you determine on a given Tuesday morning, I'm going to cover this story and I'm going to not cover that story, um, your, your judgments are in play. Uh, and, it, and, and, and that follows all the way through to the process, right? Uh, including where they put a story in the paper. It's on page one, it's on page 13. Um, uh, but uh, what we have now, uh, so objectivity is a complicated matter. I, I think it's extremely important um, to hold to it as best we can. Is the objective truth about any given situation, a war, a robbery, a fire, uh, available? Yes, of course, right? Uh, uh, it, are they easy to find? In the case of a fire, I suppose so, but in the case of a war, maybe not. Um, uh, but we need to move on to the question of subjectivity. Over the last few years, when around mid-Russiagate or so, well, the Trump administration when Trump became president, the, the New York Times announced on page one, I kid you not, that they are, are not any longer going to be able to report objectively about the administration in Washington. We're not even trying, they said. Page one, Jim Rutenberg, the media correspondent. Um, Let's face it, he said, objectivity is on vacation. We're not covering the Trump administration objectively. What a, what a daringly stupid thing to say, right? Or, or more to the point, think. Uh, <coughs> uh, subsequent to that, we had in the New Yorker uh, and on one of the networks, I think CNN, these assertions by uh, reporters who have been elevated to... Uh, you know, uh, positions of, you know, elevated in the profession, saying, no, 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 objectivity is dead. One of them, a man named Lowry, said, uh, it's a failed experiment. I, we are in very dangerous territory here, right? Well, I'm not, but they are. They're leading the profession into a very dangerous territory. Um, uh, if you can't believe the New York Times on Donald Trump, and I'm here to tell you, you couldn't, uh, can you believe the New York Times on what happened on West 44th Street yesterday, or uh, a, a fire in Portland, Oregon, or Russia, or China, or Iran, or Venezuela? These people have no sense by way of this stuff. They create all these problems that... that the complaint now is that Americans don't trust the media. The, the, the statistics are all there on this point, right? Yeah. And what do the papers say? Well, that's the problem. You know, we have to, uh, uh, it, it's our readers that have a problem, not us. <laughs> Shall we leave that there? Yeah, yeah, um, that's a good place to leave that. And so kind of related to that question, um, how, how is it you think that historians like John Mearsheimer and journalists like Ann Applebaum, who have similar um, you know, educational backgrounds, they both come from Ivy League schools, equally appealing resumes. Um, another example could be uh, like Janet Yellen and Richard Wolff, uh, if you're talking about economics. Um, how do they have such contrasting views on important issues? In the case of Mearsheimer and Applebaum um, on you, on a, uh, on an issue like Ukraine, um, what do you think is at play uh, when these people that are, you know, probably equipped intellectually, uh, relatively equally, have such different views? What's what's at play there? You think? Yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, the Jesuits have a term. That you know the term discernment, to discern. We, uh, 
we have an ordinary understanding of um, what it means to discern something. I, I see it right, roughly. Mm. The Jesuits, I, I encourage you to look this up, have a very specific meaning for discernment. Discernment means uh, is, is an individual person's capacity to judge events independently, autonomous, autonomously from uh, any ideological tilt or bias, right? Um, and I, I raise that because I think the, the difference, first of all, there are various kinds of educational discipline now. You know, there are, there are economics departments in, in American universities that are, that are tilted this way, that way, or the other way by way of what they teach. Wolf would represent one and, you know, uh, the history department at University of Wisconsin-Madison, famously progressive history department, but there are other kinds of, there are other, there are other intellectual traditions. This is fine. But I, I think what, what we have in, in a lot of these cases uh, is um, the coloring of intellectual judgment by ideology. It, in, in other words, um, there's no discernment is, is what you're saying. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Socrates argued reason must determine belief. Sounds mm -hmm. pretty simple. But uh, what we have in a lot of these cases is belief determining reason. In other words, thought is instrumentalized. I, I have turned into an instrument, okay? I must conclude this. So what's, how am I gonna get there, right? Uh, uh, so logic, if, if the destination of a logical process is predetermined, the logical process has to conform to the predetermined belief. That's what I think goes on in a lot of these cases. Uh, I don't wish to sound too eggheady about it, but uh, I, I think uh, in simple terms, ideology is, is too prevalent in American thought. Right, a hundred percent. And, you know, I guess not risking oversimplifying this whole thing, but in terms of the, the, the structure of, of the press and, and kind of the government and, and the military industrial complex, who do you believe this all truly serves? Do you think it's the, this complex that is, uh, you know, shaping this narrative? Uh, and do you think it like gets to the top levels of bureaucracy at a press organization that, um, you know, it trickles down from, you know, uh, editors to reporters and so forth? Or do you think, like we just mentioned, it's kind of like a, this this ever present ideology kind of bubble that people are trapped? Yeah, in? yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> look, um, uh, where to start here? I I think something important happened in this line at, at the time of the leaked Clinton emails. Um, at that moment, uh, Trump was out on the hustings advertising his foreign policy ideas. Uh, I'm not a man of Trump, um, but uh, he had some good ideas. I don't hesitate to say that. What is NATO all about? Um, we should have a better, more constructive relationship with Russia? Why are we waging these wars of adventure? Let us stop them. I count these good ideas. The, um, the military industrial complex was very, very threatened by 
these ideas. Uh, and I think it was at that point that they determined if this man is elected, we are going to have to sink him. Um, I'm okay with the term deep state. I find it interesting that the term deep state, which the background is goes back to Turkey. That's not pertinent here. Uh, I, I'm okay with this statement, with that phrase. And uh, I find it interesting that it appeared in American discourse it, while Trump was running for president. Right? So uh, we have the interests of the national security state all together. Then the emails were leaked uh, and uh, the Democratic Party leadership had an interest in uh, deflecting uh, the public's attention and concern uh, away from what was in those emails where they were, you know, we never even talk about it anymore. They were quite shocking, right? Uh, uh, and uh, their method was to, uh, was a sort of shoot the messenger exercise. Uh, never mind what's in the emails, they, the Russians hacked them, right? Uh, so they had an interest at that point that converged. I don't mean to suggest that mainstream Democrats did not have a common interests with the national security state long before this, but they had a very specific interest in, uh, in, in the, the Russian, the idea of Russian responsibility from that time onward, right? And, and then the media um, uh, simply continued to play the role it has for a long, long time. Um, which is to support these other two legs of the stool. And to the national security state in time, we have to add domestic law enforcement, uh, DOJ, Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, because they got in on it too. And so we have a, a, a kind of very uh, pernicious uh, alliance um, and, uh, I, I think that's what's operative here, okay? Uh, I would like to mention, if I can have a minute or two, uh, uh, another way of looking at what happened in 2016. Uh, you may remember uh, Francis Fukuyama's book, um, The End of History, uh, wherein he argued that uh, now that the Soviet Union is no more. Uh, liberal democracy uh, is, is the only game in town. Liberal democracy has won uh, and there's no further for humanity to explore or go. We have arrived at, quote, the end of history. That's what he meant, right? I think the Clinton candidacy uh, uh, subsequent to that, we had two, two terms of George W. and then Obama, all right? Uh, and I think 2016 was conceived in uh, the liberal imagination as the moment when the liberal order would finally be consolidated uh, for the indefinite future. That's the significance of Hillary Clinton's candidacy. So that when she lost, it was not merely a political, a very large political loss. Um, it, was, it was a psychological shock. Uh, all of the expectations that had been poured into the Clinton candidacy, and we all remember it was an absolute given that she was going to win. Uh, all of those expectations and, uh, were overturned. Uh, and, and I think that accounts for the extraordinary vigor, not to say hysteria, that went into the 
savage attempts, pretty much successful, to, to subvert the Trump administration. Again, I'm not defending the Trump administration straight across the board, but uh, it's plain that he was the object of a very, very concerted effort to, uh, you know, suborn his uh, policies, especially on the national security side, right? So I think that's what happened. Now, the role of the journalists, uh, the tail end of your question, Diego, um, a lot of what happens in newspapers, the major newspapers, is unspoken. Um, you understand on the way in what is expected of you, uh, and you understand on the way in, I like to put it this way, you know where the fence posts are, and you don't operate beyond the fence posts. That's the simplest way I can put, you know, uh, things. Uh, I, I think there are many occasions when copy is rewritten. Um, but by and large, a New York Times correspondent in, you know, name the, name the bureau knows how he or she needs to cover that country without really being told. Hard to explain to people not in the profession, right? Right. Um, and what does it say about the military and the military industrial complex and, and how important it is to American government that Trump, someone who, like you said, had these good ideas, maybe these anti-war ideas rhetorically, but when it came down to the actions his administration took, he seemed very easily talked out of these um, ideas constantly he right was a, it seemed he, even... was a, he was a, he was a weird messenger as i put it right uh, yeah a yeah Spanish and, messenger and uh it seemed even that was too much for them right that they uh took all these measures to kind of um uh you know like prop up these this idea that he was uh, a russian spy and and that the clinton emails weren't to, to be looked at and things like that uh, what, what does that say about the military industrial complex that even someone like Trump, who never actually did anything anti-war really, or maybe the, there's, a couple, there, there's a couple of things he did, but um, for the most part, his big promises like getting out of Afghanistan um, were never kept. Uh, what does that say about uh, uh, how the military industrial complex functions that even that is too much for them? It says, it says that the military industrial complex is frightening. That's what it says. Right. And, and the power of it, um, <clears throat> apart from the overarching power of it, its ability to operate in very particular circumstances is, uh, should be of equal concern. Example, Trump wanted to get the troops out of Syria. A very good idea. He ordered the troops out of Syria. Uh, and then the Pentagon. Uh, and various appendages of the national security state uh, used various methods to stop that, to block that policy. It's been admitted. Uh, we just slow walked him. Uh, we refused to do it, right? And what I, I, I try to explain this to people at the time, nobody's much interested anymore, but uh, uh, I tried to explain this at the time. Look, in April of 17, Trump was in, tr Trump was in office a few months and he ordered uh, a major adjustment of uh, troops in the Middle East preparatory to a withdrawal, Iraq, I think. Um, and the Pentag the generals blocked it. He just couldn't get his way. Um, and uh, Trump gave a speech, I call it his my general's speech, right? He got up and said, uh, I'm giving my generals more autonomy to make decisions on the ground. I'm leaving, I'm leaving the judgments to them. Maxwell, what was he doing there? They made a fool out of him. 
And his only way out was to pretend, was to put his name on it and pretend he was all for it. Yeah. You see? Yeah. Now that went on all during his administration. I, I try to correct people time and time and time again. Trump did this. I said, stop. Trump didn't do this. The Trump administration did this. This is the Trump administration was one of the most opaque, confused, conflicted administrations in my lifetime, maybe the most conflicted uh, administration in my lifetime. There was an occasion in um, concerning Iraq, uh, Iran, um, what was it? Uh, uh, we sent some missiles. Uh, we've sent some missiles into Iranian airspace. Uh, I can't remember the detail. Trump was down at Mar-a-Lago. The policy decision was made by Pompeo, Secretary of State at the time, and Mark Esper, Defense Secretary. Um, this was in the paper exactly once and then disappeared. They made the decision on the policy in Washington and got on a plane early the next morning and flew to Mar-a-Lago and said, President Trump, we have decided this, this is the policy. He wasn't even in Washington. Uh, and uh, so later when we started talking about Trump did this, it's not accurate. Trump came out and said, yes, that's what I decided. Do you see the game, right? You see what happened? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> they would make the decision for him and then so he wouldn't look like, like so you know, a coward. So he doesn't look like a complete he, jackass. He, he yeah. signs on to the <laughs> policy. It's his only way out, right? I mean, it, let's face it, Trump is not a man of great principle, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, my word is frightening. I, I think it's, I think it's, let's not get into number one, number two, number three, but I think it is very, very high among the most, the gravest problems this nation faces is the, is the unchecked power of the military industrial complex, um, virtually uh, in, not subject to civilian rule or oversight, the people who are supposed to be exercising oversight are part of it, right? Um, um, I, 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 think it's, uh, uh, I think it's a very grave problem by way of determining our country's direction. And in another dimension, if we don't stop giving them all the money we are giving them, uh, we are not going to be able to repair this country, schools, roads, bridges, what have you, right? Uh, institute, social institutions of all sorts. Uh, we're broke. Uh, and what are they getting? 57, 60% of every discretionary tax dollar. Uh, uh, so there's the policy part. This, this country needs to change direction quite radically. Uh, if we're going to do well in the 21st century, and we can do well in the 21st century if we make up our minds, uh, um, and also um, by way of policy and also by way of uh, putting this country back together just materially, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Patrick Lawrence, uh, for coming on and talking to us. That was a great conversation. Um, okay. Yeah, so uh, we'll see you next time, hopefully. And okay. uh, thank you so much for doing this. You're very yeah. well. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate you. Great Cheers answers. You. And uh, yeah. We, yeah, we hope to talk to you again soon. Okay. Take care. Right.